okay yeah we can begin yes so um we've come to the concluding chapter of our course uh which just is like more like a reminder to us of why we have in fact done this entire course you know why are we focusing so much on holiness and uh, overcoming the evil one overcoming the world and the flesh and uh, where is the point uh, what's the main focus of why we are doing all of this why should we be living an overcoming life and there are just three points mentioned you know in this final chapter uh, so um, this is basically why we choose to overcome temptation this is basically why we choose to you know um, not get swayed by satan uh, it is because uh, we want to honor god uh, we want to you know uh, reach out to the world by world i mean the people in the world we want to reach out to them and uh, help them get delivered out of the grip of the world and the grip of satan and we want to um, be fruitful in whatever it is whatever calling it is that god has placed on our lives so we will look at these three points uh, but before we do that um, this this a verse with which you know your final chapter begins uh, that would be matthew 11 verse 12 uh, so maybe we can read out that uh, look at the significance of that and then move into our three points all right so um, if someone could read out for us matthew 11 verse 12 please matthew 11 verse 12 Matthew 11 was 12 and from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffer violence and the violent take it by force yeah. yeah and here when Jesus speaks these words we get the impression that he's speaking it in a positive sense uh, so he is happy that people are being violent he seems to be happy that they are forcefully taking the kingdom so over here it's not talking about the evil one overcoming the kingdom of god it's not talking about any attack um uh, any evil attack against the kingdom of god uh, rather it seems to be talking in a positive sense because this is what it says if you look at uh, the earlier verse you know matthew 11 verse 11 it says um that um mm, truly i tell you among those born of women no one has arisen greater than uh, john the baptist yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he from the days of john the baptist until now the kingdom of heaven has uh, suffered violence and the violent um, take it by force uh, so it talks about how even the least in the kingdom of heaven are able to take the kingdom of god violently now so in that sense that even the least person in the kingdom today is greater than john the baptist because john the baptist didn't have access to the finished work of the cross which we now have free access to so you know uh, if you are feeling ra rather small in your ministry if you're feeling rather weak and helpless you know in your personal life uh, because of the situations that you're facing if you feel that you are you if you feel like as if you are the least in the kingdom of heaven um you are greater than even john the baptist is what jesus himself is saying because now anyone who really wants to can forcefully take the things which are available to them in the kingdom of god you know they don't have to uh, just sit passively in a corner hoping that these things will drop down from heaven you know um, on to them uh, it may never happen because um, god is looking for people who will actively step out in faith and claim what belongs to them you know uh, in the kingdom of god so those who just simply sit around passively hoping that maybe some angel will come and give them all the things which they require they may never get it because uh, god is not for spiritual laziness on the other hand if someone has been stirred up by all the scriptures that they are reading and they are eager to see it accomplished in their lives and they think oh, all right i'm going to stand on these scriptures i'm going to i'm going to step out i'm going to try making these things happen even in my life in my situations and they take hold and they declare those things over their lives and they come against the evil one and they cancel his works 
and you know they're doing a lot of works a lot of works of faith working out the things you know putting into action the things which they have only learnt in theory up to now such people who are not just sitting around passively but violently actively claiming what belongs to them you know over here the wording that is used is you know um, it says that they raid uh, niv says violent people have been raiding the kingdom of god that's what god wants us to do go into the treasure house literally raid it you know, when a robber walks into um, let us say a bank it's not like he's going to take you know one one currency note from there and walk out no he's literally going to raid it is going to take everything that he can get his hands on and if there are if there are precious stones and gems in the lockers he'll take those he will take all the currency notes he will take uh, if there are bonds available over there he'll take those he'll take just about everything that he can lay his hands on you know so god wants us to be doing that rather than being passive lazy people who are just sitting there and thinking oh if god wants to do something he'll do it uh, no that's not uh, what we have been taught in scripture it talks about people who are actively in the battle and are standing their ground and having done everything to remain standing so it's very um, very clearly talking about uh, warfare it's talking about uh, active involvement and participation it's talking about taking what is yours you know it's like um, Uh, if to use a very simple example you know you, the, you know the the mother has baked a, uh, baked this lovely cake and the cake is sitting over there on the dining table and if all the kids are just you know sitting in their room and you know thinking yeah when the time comes my mother will come and she will give it to us um it may not ever happen you see she is she has done her part she's placed the cake on the table now anyone who's interested anyone who believes that the cake is indeed on the table will have to go forth you know and take their portions raid it raid the dining table and take what is theirs so there needs to be some enthusiasm from our side you know after what jesus has done on the cross after that amazing victory that he has won for us if we are just sitting around passively thinking ah if he feels like it he will give it and when he gives it i will take it uh, that kind of a um, lazy uninterested attitude is not something that god expects from us i mean imagine how that mother would feel you know after she bakes this really lovely cake and she places it over there for her family and her family is not even interested in coming and looking at it how would she feel so i think the lord enjoys it when we raid his treasure house when we take what belongs to us you know in christ um which is why he he you know even in that luke 11 passage he says um you may have a shameless friend who is not willing to get up in the night to help you uh, and then you know you have to uh, what with shameless audacity you have to go on pestering him and only then he will very reluctantly get up and give you what what you require simply because he wants to go back to sleep so you, your friends may be like that you know but what god is saying is when it comes to me all you need to do is ask and you will receive seek and you will find a knock and it will be opened to you you know is what he says so um god uh, is not like some um you know uninterested friend who doesn't really want to help who can only think about his own interests god is not like that god says if you come to me and actively ask you will receive if you seek you will find you know is what god is saying so we should not be passive when it comes to fighting the flesh you know uh, fighting overcoming the world and uh, defeating the devil so when it comes to these three things laziness is really not going to get us anywhere when we, when the flesh you know tempts us uh when we when we are stirred up to do wrong when there are when we when we when we feel when we feel an urging to go against what god has commanded we don't just passively sit over there and think oh yeah this is too strong for me no god would like his people to use the finished work of the cross to overcome in their personal lives so people who actively um you know take a stand against the flesh and they overcome the world and they cancel every work of the devil each time it happens 
such people are the ones who are violently taking their stand and saying, I will not give up my position in the kingdom. They are the ones you know, who will really come out victorious. And so that should be our uh, stand. We should be very active in our overcoming rather than you know being very passive and waiting for God to come down and do something for us. He has already come down. He has already done all that is required. Now it is our, our uh, part to come to the table and take what is laid out over there on the table for us. So having understood that, you know, um, we will look at three reasons why we, we live this kind of a holy overcoming life. It's much easier to just give in to the world, give in to the flesh, allow Satan to do what he wants, and you know, just live, exist from day to day. That would be easier. But why do we actively choose to stay holy? Why do we actively choose to overcome it? The one main thing, of course, is because we want to bring delight to the Father's heart. That's the first point that's mentioned in your notes. Uh, the verse that is given over there, uh, that's basically 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10. Uh, if someone could please read out 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad there seem to be two things mentioned over here in these verses one is that we are we, that we we are, we are doing all of this to be well pleasing to him so that he'll be very pleased with us he'll be happy with the way we are living so that's one reason why we do it and the other is because we are going to have to face the judgment you no know, seat of christ where one day we will be judged for everything that we have done in the body whether good or bad it says over here you know so um I mean, how are we to understand this? You know, should this make us very fearful? You know, because one day we are going to be facing uh, God. We are going to be facing the judgment seat of Christ. Should that make us very, very fearful in the way we choose to please him? Because we all know that, right? I mean, um, some of us who, who've had bad experiences probably will be able to acknowledge that more. Um, where we please, uh, not because we want to, but because we are too scared to not please, you know, so we, we we please out of fear because we are terrified of that person. We don't want to put that person in a bad mood. So we we try we try our best to keep that person happy uh, because we are very scared what will happen if that person gets angry. So is that the attitude that it's talking about over here? Most definitely not, right? Because that's not the impression that we get from from the uh, from the scriptures at all. Uh, so. Uh, you know, just to kind of get the right perspective, if we can also look at Romans chapter 8, verses 15 to 17. Romans 8, 15 to 17. Romans chapter 8, Romans. verses 15 to 17. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are fish in his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yeah. So when we look at 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10, in the light of this passage, uh, it helps us to have the right attitude. Over here in this passage, you see it's talking about how we are now God's own children. And this is how he wants us to address him, uh, not just with that word father, which itself is it's an intimate word, which is a good word, but we are also uh, allowed, permitted, to use this very informal word, Abba. I mean, um, you know, even back in those days, a grown-up person would not, you know, in public 
address his father as abba because that's just something that little children would it's a term that little kids would use you know um because they're still young and they uh, don't yet have a formal relationship with their parent uh, so you know so um, this was such a very informal such an intimate word and that is specifically placed over here in scripture for us we are told that the holy spirit teaches us to start using this very very informal word you know which is why some people are quite comfortable in in their prayer time uh, to you know uh, pray to the lord as you know uh, papa or you know uh, daddy you know so they use those terms uh, because that would be the english equivalent of your abba and uh, you know so, so some people who are listening may feel offended thinking my goodness how can this person pray like that you know at least they should have the decency to use the formal word father but here we see in the scripture that we are actually being encouraged to use that very intimate informal word of you know papa or daddy or you know whatever you know term that we use in our own uh, languages um, so um, the what we are being told over here is that we can be like children like little children in his presence and um, so it says in the in the very first verse romans 8 verse 15 the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again when we were in the dominion of darkness always scared always fearful what's going to happen next and that is why you have people you know offering um, all kinds of offering uh, all kinds of things in, in front of their idols because they are scared that if they don't offer those things in front of the idols what bad things will be done to them um, and 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 then you have people you know uh, who literally you know they 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 crawl on their knees all the way to that you know that temple or that church or wherever they literally they, they crawl on their knees and they go to that place uh, to to as a form of penance for all of their sins in the hope that oh if i do this then maybe god will overlook all the sinful things that i have done this is all operating out of deep fear and god says you don't have to live like that ever you know what you can actually use that most intimate word of abba not even the formal word of father but that intimate term abba is what you can use so that should be our approach to this lord so in the light of this if we are looking at ourselves as god's children with that attitude you know uh, keeping that in mind that perspective in mind if when we look at second corinthians 5 9 to 10 we see it very very differently where it says so we make it our goal to please him uh, whether we are at home in the body or away from it for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ so over here why are we choosing to please him not because we are going to be we are terrified of that judgment day but we are pleasing him because he is our abba father and coming back to you know romans 8 uh, this is what we see in Ro uh, romans 8 17 now if we are children then we are heirs heirs of god and co-heirs with christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory so our elder brother jesus christ he went through all those sufferings you know if you remember it says that he learned obedience through suffering it was not easy for him to always submit to the father's will and he did it in fact every single time never sinned every single time he chose to do the father's will it involved a lot of suffering and sacrifice he went through that so now we choose to be like our elder brother and we choose to share in his sufferings in the same way that he suffered in the same way he chose to submit to the will of god we choose to do that in the same way he carried his cross we choose to carry our cross so in that sense we become disciples we become true followers of our elder brother jesus christ and why are we doing this because i know it talks about jesus christ and it says for the for the joy that was set before him he did that 
he didn't do it grudgingly thinking oh this is something i have to go through now because my father has asked me to do that you know he says let this cup be taken away but let your will be done because he was thinking of the joy that was set before him that one day you know he would receive his you know reward um, and uh, so we we go to this you know judgment seat of christ with that same confidence uh, knowing that all the hard work we have put in you know in sharing in christ suffering now we will also share in his reward we will also share in his glory so we are not doing all of this grudgingly or negatively or fearfully we are doing it um, because now we are part of the family whatever our elder brother experienced we are also going to be experiencing most of that you know we all always pray and we say lord you know um, uh, let our life let, let let the life our lives be good let us have lot much joy and happiness and uh, in spite of that prayer we go through trials and difficulties god permits it because he is teaching us to become just like our elder brother you know now we are all part of the family so what our um, you know the triune godhead went through we kind of share in that you know the pain which they felt you know when when jesus christ had to go through what he did on the cross um, we actually are participating in whatever our heavenly father went through what our elder brother jesus christ went through we are participating in that we are sharing in that and we are learning to respond to these things the way you know our god did the way jesus responded we are learning to respond in that way towards all these difficulties so yes it is good for us to pray for you know comfortable happy joyous lives he will grant that to us grant that to us but along with that there will be trials there will be difficulties there will be tears because uh, this is part of life um, we share in the sufferings of our elder brother because we know that when we come through this victorious in the same way you know imitating him imitating the example that he set for us then we also will share in his glory so on that day when we are standing before the judgment seat of christ we are standing in front of the judge we are standing in front of the lord but we are also standing in front of our elder brother you know who who did so much for us so that we can walk in victory and he watches us so proudly when we take up our cross and we follow him and we are faithful to him it brings him joy to see us imitating him so faithfully so on that day when we are standing in front of the judgment seat um we can have this deep satisfaction of knowing that we were well pleasing to him so you see this whole thing that we are doing this overcoming life this this striving to live a holy life it's not just something that is done grudgingly it's done out of faith because we genuinely believe that we are part of god's family we now know that whatever we are going through we are going through it because he went through it and he's allowing us to go through those same things because we will start learning to imitate christ and and you know react and respond in the right manner to different things and in the process we start becoming like him and it brings great joy to the father and to the and to the lord jesus you know so the holy spirit is there to enable us equip us to live in this way and we choose to do that and so in the same way that we are sharing in his sufferings we will also share in his glory so the first reason why we choose to live in holiness uh, work towards a sanctified life is so that we can be well pleasing to our lord and of course the second thing is that we do this because the world is watching you know jesus when he came he said i didn't come for the for the for those who are well i came for the sick you know to for those who are diseased and helpless and stuck in their terrible impossible situations you know in their sin i have come for such people and so this world which is full of sick people who are stuck and trapped in their in their uh, you know uh, uh, sin ridden lives they are watching they may watch mockingly at first 
you know, they may make fun of us and they may say we are so ridiculous because our standards are so different, our priorities are so different. So they may think that we are, um, what, museum exhibits, you know, something strange to be stared at and wondered at. But gradually, when we continue to continue to live in this particular way and they see the hand of God on our lives, when they see how in spite of the difficulties we have not uh, been defeated, but we have learned to overcome and they see that we are living victoriously in spite of all the things that are going on, then they start watching in a different way. They start feeling hope in their hearts. They start thinking that maybe what this person has, if I turn to this God that this person has, maybe things can change in my life as well. Maybe I don't have to stay you know, in, in, in this stuck in this addiction anymore. Maybe I too will be able to overcome. It starts putting hope in their hearts because they, you know, I mean, if you notice today, ah, there's so much talk about influencers, you know, online. It talks about, you know, all the, you know, uh, uh, what clicking on the likes and clicking on the dislikes. People are hunting for role models. They are like desperate for someone that they can put on a pedestal and look up to, you know, because they, they don't believe in God. They don't think about him, but but something in their heart aches for someone to imitate because that's the, that's what God has created us for, right? That we are meant to be like our creator. They have dismissed the creator. They don't want any part of the creator. And so they try to place human beings on the, you know, influencers, people that they can look up to and admire and follow. So such people, it's important that we represent Christ to them. So the way we live, they are watching and that can either just, you know, make them feel disgust or it can start stirring up hope and a desire for something more. So if we are living badly, then they'll just be disgusted and say, oh, this is the way all Christians are. But if they are watching us and they see Christ reflected in our lives, they may think, yes, I've seen a lot of Christians who are disgusting, but these people are different. They seem to really have this Christ, which is talked about in the Bible. And so then they start feeling hope in their hearts that maybe they too can change. Maybe their lives also can be transformed. And when they see us overcoming very, very painful, difficult situations and coming out of it victorious, they think, oh my goodness, if the, if the, if the power of this God can help them come out of something like that, and live in joy and victory, my goodness, maybe if I place my hope in this God, that same power will be released into my life as well. So we are really, we can make a huge difference in people's lives, you know. So um, this is what it talks about in 2 Corinthians 2, 14. You know, if someone can read out 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. 2 Corinthians. 2 verse 14 now thanks be to god who always leads us in triumph in christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge and over here in niv it says he spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere so these people are not interested in opening the bible and reading it they are not interested in listening to the sermons that are there on YouTube, but they like to watch. They really like watching people. And so they watch us. And so we become the aroma of the knowledge of him. So they look at us and they see his fragrance in our lives. Even when we are being you know, hurt and crushed, they see that in spite of it all, we are able to hold on because we, are, we have someone sustaining us, someone who is holding us up, who is helping us. They see that and that fragrance starts, you know, um, influencing them. So um, we can make a difference in people's lives. We can show them that they are not helpless. If they can just come to the Lord Jesus, their lives also can be changed. And they begin to realize that sin is not as powerful and the evil spirits in Satan are not that uh, uh, you know, difficult to overcome because here we are believers doing it on a daily basis. So they, they realize that, oh, okay, 
you know, if these people are not living under the fear of all these evil spirits, and if they are able to overcome, then maybe this Satan and these evil ones and these evil spirits are not really as great and as powerful and as scary as we thought. We too can overcome them. So it, it helps them to get a godly perspective of this entire situation of life and all of that. Um, so that's the second main reason why we choose to uh, strive towards holiness and you know, and live overcoming lives. The third one is, of course, so that we individually as believers can be fruitful. Nobody likes to live an entire lifetime, put in so much hard work, and then you know um, find out at the end that they didn't achieve anything. That their life was utterly fruitless, useless. Who on earth would ever want that? Every little thing that we do for God, it's our desire that it is somehow bearing some fruit, that we are that it's making an impact for God's kingdom in some way. I mean, that's the desire with which we do it, right? No one does it just because of out of a sense of duty, saying, oh, fine, I have to go and do this because it's my duty, and so I will do it. No, we never, nobody ever does these things passively. We do it because we genuinely want to believe that these little efforts that we are putting in are somehow making a difference you know, for the kingdom of God, and, and it's bringing pleasure to the heart of God in some way. So that is the reason why we do what we do. So it is so important uh, that we uh, you know, understand why we are putting in all this effort. Um, 2 Peter 1, verses 8 and 9. If someone can read out 2 Peter 1, 8 and 9. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Yes. And what are these, you know, it says, for if you possess these things, you know, possess these qualities, it's talking about the earlier verse, um, 2 Peter 1, verse, you know, 6 and 5, 6 and 7, where it talks about how uh, to your faith you add goodness, and to your goodness you add knowledge, and to your knowledge you add self-control. Uh, you're, you're, you're kind of adding something more to the qualities which you already have in Christ. You know, you keep adding on to it. Why? So that uh, it says you will be kept from being ineffective and unproductive. So uh, nobody wants that. Uh, it says over here, whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. So they live defeated, the, the ones who are blind, uh, they live defeated lives because they are not adding on to what has already been given to them. So at the moment of salvation, when that person places their faith in Jesus Christ, you know, that's also is, is, is also a gift we saw, right? Nobody is able to believe on their own. They are given the gift of faith to be able to believe in Jesus. And that is how they are able to do that so that nobody can boast. Uh, so once they have received this gift of faith, you are expected to keep adding on to that the other things which are you know available to you now in the treasure house of the kingdom of God. So which is why it says over here, um, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness and then you know to support this goodness which you are now gaining to support that with knowledge and then whatever knowledge you are gaining on a daily basis you know to add to that self control so that you are able to use that you know knowledge you know, in a in a, in a, in, a, in a wise manner in, in your in your in your you know in your everyday uh, practical circumstances and then uh, to that self control you add endurance because at times it becomes really difficult and then you 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 know you start adding endurance to that you don't just say oh good nice now i received this gift of faith and you don't just sit there sit over there with with that you know that with that gift of faith you add on all the other things that are available to you from the treasure house you continue to raid that treasure house continue to draw upon all that is available to you in christ you keep doing that so that one day, you know, you will be a, you will be able to stand complete. You will not be ineffective. You will not be unproductive. But rather, you will accomplish what you were meant to. You will be able to fulfill the things that God has, you know, for your for your life. And and so 
um, it says, you know, add, add to whatever you already have. Keep adding daily. And when you do that, then it says, you know, we will be able to live fruitful lives. Um, so when we talk about fruitfulness, we talk about fruitfulness in two senses. Uh, we talk about fruitfulness in all that we do in the sense, whatever I'm doing, it has made some impact for the kingdom. It has accomplished something in the spiritual realm, you know, uh, and it has brought you know, pleasure and joy to the father's heart. So we we talk about fruitfulness in that sense. And there's also the other aspect of fruitfulness, right, where you start becoming like uh, Jesus himself. And that, of course, is talked about in Galatians chapter five. Uh, verses 22 to 23, where it talks about that one single fruit of the spirit, which uh, starts uh, it starts showing in your life. People who look at you start seeing this one single fruit. What is this one single fruit of the spirit which they see in your life? It's the love and the joy and the peace and the forbearance and the kindness and the goodness and the faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. So, you know, um, all of this is basically that one fruit of the spirit. It's basically his nature. It is who he is. So literally who Jesus is, you know, all the love and the joy and the kindness and the faithfulness and all that which he has in him, that starts showing up in your life. You start looking like that. When people look at you, that's what they start seeing. And how does that happen? It just happens when you choose to walk by the spirit. You choose to be led by him rather than living by the flesh. You choose to follow the spirit. So on a daily basis, even as you are learning to overcome, even as you are striving towards holiness, you resist the temptations which come your way. You overcome the worldly standards, you know, which others are very happily giving into. You do all of that with the help of the Holy Spirit. He leads you step by step. So even as you're walking in step with the spirit and not fulfilling you know, the other lusts of the flesh and the temptations of the world and giving in to the attacks of the evil one, even as you're refusing to just give up, even as you're walking in faith, you actually start looking like Christ. When people look at you, they will see love, they will see joy, peace, or forbearance, kindness, goodness, they will start seeing all of these things. So we will be fruitful um, in the sense that we, whatever we have done uh, will, will bear good results and have some kind of eternal um, you know, benefit. And we, are also, we also uh, strive towards being fruitful in who we are becoming as persons, where we become more and more like Christ. So we keep in mind that we are going through this rather difficult process of overcoming so that we can bring joy to our father and one day when we go and stand in front of the judgment seat of christ we can have the assurance that we were that we lived in a way uh, that imitated him that imitated christ that imitated our elder brother so you know so we will have that um, assurance that we have done it in the right manner the second reason why we live the overcoming life is so that the world which is watching desperately looking for role models when they see our lives they will feel hope they'll think that maybe my life too can change in the same way this person's life is getting changed it puts hope in their hearts and third we do it because each of us has been called with a calling it, I, I don't mean just a calling you know for uh, full-time ministry because we all have different kinds of callings we have callings as you know parents we have there are callings that we have you know in society uh, because of the roles that god has given to us in society in reaching out to people there are callings which we have um, you know which which are expressed in our workplace where we touch people's lives in different ways you know in that work environment where we are you know working on some secular project but god is using us over there he has a calling for us over there so we all have this desire to be to be uh, to to be successful in fulfilling these callings and he will make it happen even as we keep our eyes focused upon him and uh, so we choose to be overcoming so that we can be fruitful for the kingdom of god um so uh, yeah this was more like a, you know summation of all that uh, we've looked at over the past three months i think yeah <laughs> so yeah we, we, we are basically done with the course now um 
you know, uh, if anyone at all wants to ask any doubts or questions, you can do that. Uh, otherwise, you know, we'll close with a word of prayer. And of course, I will post the, uh, you know, assessment. So we had 50 questions in the, you know, multiple choice questions in the midterm. We'll do that again now for the final. You'll have another 50 uh, multiple choice questions. And um, um, the portion for this will be from wherever we had stopped, I suppose. I don't particularly remember, but I think, you know, um, overcoming life is not something that we have touched in the assessment. The previous assessment that we had, uh, it dealt with that whole concept of holiness, you know, understanding the holiness of God, why we need to be holy, all of that. And we also, I'm pretty sure, uh, um, covered the portion on repentance and, you know, that, that whole thing, that whole uh, repentance section also, I think, got covered in your last assessment. So uh, for this assessment, the portion will, will, will yeah, most probably be just the overcoming life. So all the chapters which we, we covered in the overcoming life, uh, that will form the portion for uh, this semester, you know, yeah, for, for this particular exam. So any questions at all? Uh, otherwise, you know, we'll, we'll just close with a word of prayer. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, but yeah, any questions? And yeah, you know, I admit that uh, all that we have covered, it's not easy. It can only be done by the you know power of the Holy Spirit. But that should not be a statement which makes us feel defeated because this power of uh, the Holy Spirit is literally the resurrection power of God. So it has no limits to what it can accomplish through us. So even the least in the kingdom of God uh, has got this resurrection power operating in them. Uh, so we never have to feel that, oh, I will not be able to overcome. Yes, we will all be able to overcome. So yes, I think there are no questions. So let's just conclude with a word of prayer and you know commit ourselves into the Lord's hands. Thank you so much, O Lord, for all that we could cover uh, over the last three months. Lord, there are so many lessons that you taught us. Now, there are things that were impressed upon our hearts where when you directly, uh, you know, um, spoke something to us directly regarding our own personal situations. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we will walk in all of these things that you have revealed to us. You enable us, you equip us. From our side, all we are asked to do is to walk in step with the Spirit. The rest of it, you will do through your Spirit. So you're the one who will give us the power. You are the one who will enable us. You're the one who will give us the strategy to overcome the evil one whenever he attacks. You're the one, O oh Lord, who will guide us in, in all of these things. From our side, all we are being asked to do is to take up our cross and be willing to, uh, to listen to you and submit to you and obey trustingly, even when it is very, very difficult. If we can just cooperate from our side, then you, O oh Lord, will take care of the rest. Thank you so much, O oh Lord, that you have given us this assurance. On our own, we could never make it. But in you, O oh Lord, victory is guaranteed, except for those who choose to be lazy. For everyone else, victory is guaranteed. If we can set aside our spiritual laziness, O oh Lord, we can accomplish great things um, through you. So we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to give up on all spiritual laziness, that we will actively overcome the flesh and overcome the world, O oh Lord, and cancel the works of the evil one every time he makes an attempt to overcome us. So we pray that you would, O oh Lord, help us. You make us victors, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, yeah. So thank you. And uh, yeah, have a good week. And regarding the, the, the prayer, you know, which uh, Enoch had mentioned, I will follow up on that and we'll see what can be done. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.